Hello everyone and welcome back. We are back with week five of the fourth quarter and we are still going to be discussing non-renewable energy and today's lecture is going to be over 17.3 which is the consequences of fossil fuel use. Our guiding question is what problems are associated with fossil fuel use? Um, and this will cover uh, lectures for Monday and Tuesday, and we will have a stopping point mid-through. So first we're going to start with 17.3 chapter vocabulary, which is acid drainage, energy conservation. By the end of this lecture, uh, our Mondays and Tuesdays lecture, we should be able to explain how pollutants released by fossil fuels damage health and the environment. We should be able to describe the environmental and health effects of mining and drilling. We should be able to explain the implications of dependence on foreign nations for fossil fuels. And lastly, we need to be able to explain why energy conservation is important. Once you're done with your vocab, come back and we restart the video. All right, guys, lesson 17.3, consequences of fossil fuel use. Fighting to survive. <clears throat> but before we uh, go to the next slide, uh, this first image here uh, is showing us a smokestack and it says here the United States import imports two-third of its crude oil and so we'll see a map of uh, a world map of that later where those sources are coming from so fighting to survive the nine coal miners trapped 73 meters which is 240 feet underground could do only one thing to let the world know that they were still alive. They tapped on air pipes and hoped that someone on the surface would hear the taps. The accident that trapped the miners happened on July 24, 2002, in Quay Creek, Pennsylvania. The miners were working deep underground when a wall collapsed. The opening created by the collapse led to an abandoned mine filled with water. The bitterly cold water rushed into the miners' work area. Within seconds, the area had flooded. The miners were trapped in an air pocket and couldn't get out. Rescuers went to work as soon as they realized what had happened. At first, they had no luck. Finally, a huge drill broke through into the miners' area, and much-needed air could be pumped in. After three days underground, the miners were finally rescued. One by one, all nine of them were lifted to safety. Their families and friends, who had almost given up hope, began to celebrate. The Quay Creek accident is a reminder that fossil fuels comes with costs as well as benefits. Workers risk their lives to obtain the fuels that we need, and use of the fuels can also cause damage. And so this is an image of one of the miners being pulled out after that event. Now we're going to take a quick look at our real data for this chapter. And it says here, carbon dioxide from fossil fuels. The combustion of fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is the major greenhouse gas that is increasing in the atmosphere because of human activities. The graph shows how the release of carbon dioxide by the burning of oil, coal, and natural gas can change or has changed since 1800. Study the graph and then answer the questions. So first we're going to take a look at the graph. And you see that we always want to look at the title first. Carbon dioxide emissions by fossil fuels is what we're looking at. And what are we comparing? We are comparing the X and the Y axis. The X axis has our uh, years. So we are, it's asking us to compare the change since 1800. So that's when it starts. And then through uh, into the current years. 
or, or close to. Uh, and then we're comparing that by billions of metric tons of carbon per year. And then we have our key here. We want, always want to look at our key. Uh, purple is our total amount of emissions. Uh, this orange or gold is our oil. Green is our coal and blue is our natural gas. So let's take a look at the questions. It says number one, interpret graphs. What does the purple line on the graph represent? Well, to answer that, we go to our key. Purple, again, was our total. So that is the sum of oil, coal, and natural gas combined, and that gives us our total amount of carbon emissions per year for all of the fossil fuels. And it's showing it to us from 1800 to the present. Number two, relate cause and effect. Around what year did the total emissions of carbon dioxide from fossil fuels begin to go up dramatically? And then it asks, what do you think accounts for this dramatic change? Hint, around that time, how did people's lifestyles begin to change? So we're going along and we see an increase. Uh, and then we start seeing right about here a really steep increase. So we're going to say around the 1950s, and what do we keep talking about that it happened during that time was the um, Industrial Revolution, right? So a huge increase for demand in energy, for new machinery and new technology, uh, building, all of those. Number three, analyze data. Which two fossil fuels release the most carbon dioxide into the atmosphere? So it wants us to compare the three and which two uh, have the most. So we see the blue line has the least, which means the orange and the green, which is oil and coal, would have uh, more carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere. Number four, predict. Do you think the overall trend shown on the graph will change? Explain your answer. So um, what we would say is uh, as we see an increase, if our population increases, if that's causing the increase in use and consumption of these, uh, that we would see this trend to also increase. Of course, that would... Uh, could be curbed by, you know, new technology, something that would reduce the use of these fossil fuels or use them more efficiently. Uh, so outside of new technology, we would probably expect to see the graph climb until those resources were no longer available. I'll pause here in case you want to get those answers for the real data written down. All right. Pollution from fossil fuels. When they are burned, fossil fuels release substances that contribute to climate change and cause pollution. In addition, the processes involved in a obtaining and refining fuels can harm human health and the environment. Some of these effects are we're going to go through next. So releasing greenhouse gases. All fossil fuels contain carbon. When fossil fuels burn, they release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. As we have learned, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, and carbon dioxide produced by the combustion of fossil fuels warms the atmosphere and drives changes in global climate. Because of its role in global climate change, carbon dioxide pollution is becoming recognized as the greatest environmental impact of fossil fuel use. It also contributes to air pollution. The burning of coal and oil releases sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides which contribute to industrial and photochemical smog and cause acid deposition. However, catalytic converters have cut down on the release of pollutants by motor vehicles. To reduce pollution by power plants, the U.S. government and industries are working to develop 
a coal-fired power plant that does not release pollutants. We also have water pollution. Fossil fuels pollute waters as well as the air. For example, some oil from non-point sources, such as industries, homes, and cars, runs from its sources. This oil is run off, can contaminate water in or on the ground. Eventually, this runoff oil enters rivers and streams. From there, the oil may be carried to the ocean. Huge oil spills from ships and platforms also can severely damage marine environments. This was the case with the Exxon Valdez spill in 1989. Oil from Alaska's North Slope had been piped to the port of Valdez and loaded onto the ship. Leaving the port, the ship grounded, causing a huge oil spill. The spilled oil caused massive long-term environmental damage to Alaska's Prince William Sound. 21 years later, the Deepwater Horizon, on offshore drilling rig, explored in the Gulf of Mexico, exploded. The resulting oil spill will likely be more devastating than the Valdez spill. Lastly, effects on health. Numerous health risks are associated with fossil fuels. Mercury, for example, which is present in coal in trace amounts, is released from coal-fired power plants. Mercury can damage the central nervous system and the kidneys and cause severe nausea. Motor vehicles release pollutants that irritate the nose, throat, and lungs. Gases such as hydrogen sulfide can evaporate from certain kinds of crude oil and irritate the eyes and throat. Crude oil also often contains trace amounts of poison, such as lead and arsenic. So here we see a bunch of smog over the city. And it says, did you know coal burning power plants cause 40% of mercury emissions due to human activity in the United States? So looking at uh, the two events that they mentioned in our book was the, um, in 1979, uh, you had exploratory oil well here, 50 meters below the surface. There was a release of 126 million gallons of oil. There was a containment effort that took nine months. What didn't work, they were uh, the cap, the sink hon sip honing, controlled burn, and top kill. What did work was relief wells. And in 2010, there was a Deepwater Horizon oil well, which was at um, 1,500 meters below the surface. It was the largest U.S. offshore oil breach as of 2010, where there was 21.2, or between that and 33.5 million gallons of oil released during the first six weeks, based on uh, the USGS rough estimates. Hundreds of miles of coastal habitats were threatened and methods tried is the dome cap, siphoning, controlled burns, top kill, junk shot, and relief wells. And in the image we see the controlled burns attempt to contain oil pumping into the Gulf one month after the 2010 well blowout. So damage caused by extracting fuels, which is what we were just looking at. Um, so in most cases, it isn't easy to remove fossil fuels from the ground. Tunnels often must be dug and holes must be drilled. Expensive technology is needed and energy is required. And the process takes a long time. Jobs in mining and oil operations can be very dangerous, and damage to the environment can result from the extraction of those fossil fuels. Some of the dangers in mining. 
there are underground coal mining uh, today is one just one of our society's most dangerous occupations. As the uh, Quay Creek accident and the other mining accidents have shown in the from the past, miners risk injury or death from collapsing shafts and tunnels. In addition, miners risk their health by inhaling coal dust, which can lead to respiratory diseases, including a disease called black lung disease. So next is strip mining and the environment. Strip mining, as we have already discussed uh, in past chapters, can destroy large areas of habitat and cause extensive soil erosion. Acid drainage occurs when sulfide minerals in exposed rock surfaces react with oxygen and rainwater to produce sulfuric acid. As the acid runs off, it removes metals from the rocks, and both the acid and the metals enter groundwater and water bodies. In high concentrations, many of these metals are toxic to living things. Acid drainage occurs through natural processes as well as mining. However, it speeds up when mining exposes many new rock surfaces at once. Regulations in the United States require mining companies to restore land that has been strip mined. However, the efforts are still severe and they last a long time. Mountaintop removal can have an even greater impact than ordinary strip mining. Tons of rock and soil are removed from the top of the mountain. That material may accidentally slide downhill or it may be deliberately dumped downhill in order to dispose of it. The rock and soil may destroy land habitats and clog waterways. Now that we've talked about mining, let's discuss oil and gas extraction. Developing an oil or gas field involves much more than just drilling. For example, roads must be built and housing for workers must be constructed. Workers build pipelines to carry the fuel. These activities may harm plants and animals. Out in Pudho Bay. Tundra veg vegetation at Pudho Bay still has not fully recovered from temporary roads that have not been used in 30 years. Experts do not agree on whether the region's caribou have been harmed. Surveys show that caribou po population has increased since Pudho Bay has, was developed. Other studies, however, show that female caribou and their calves avoid all parts of the Pudho Bay oil complex. other possible impacts. To protect the ecological effects of drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, scientists have ex examined the effects in similar environments in Alaska. In addition, they have conducted some experiments to determine what might happen. Based on these studies, many scientists predict that wildlife and plants will be damaged. Oil spills can harm plants, and sometimes plants can be buried under gravel pits or roads. Roads can break up habitats. Other scientists, however, think that drilling in the Arctic refuge will not affect the environment that much. For example, they point out that most drilling would take place in the winter when caribou are not in the area. They also note that technology has improved in the time since the Pudho Bay oil fields were developed and claim that development of the Arctic refuge would be more sensitive to the environment. In the image we see acid drainage coming from a coal mine. So remember that also included a lot of heavy metals. All right, guys, uh, that's it for Monday's lecture. So if you want to take a pause here, complete your workbook questions numbers one through seven, and I've emailed the key home. So look for that there. Uh, come back and see me Tuesday or continue on if you're ready for it.
All right, hello everyone, or welcome back from your workbook. And we're going to look at this world map, like I promised yesterday. And this map is showing us the distribution of oil reserves in thousand million barrels uh, in different regions across the world. Uh, and we have a little map it uh, questionnaire to answer uh, for that. So let's, of course, look at our key. So again, we see the title is Proven Reserves at the end of 2008, and it gives us our units there, which are 1,000 million barrels. And it shows us Asia Pacific, 4 point, or 42, excuse me, 42.0, North America, 70.9, South America, and Central America is like this purpley pink, which is 123.2, Africa is the yellowy gold uh, with 125.6. Our bright green is Europe and Eurasia at 142.2. And then the mint or light green is Middle East with 754.1. And then uh, the gray lines indicate that that's a national border. All right, so let's look at our map it. And it says, study the map in figure 17, which we're looking at, and answer the following questions. Number one is interpret maps. Which region of the world has the least oil? And approximately how much oil can be found in that part of the world? Okay, well, of course, we always just want to look at our key for those types of questions. So we're going to go over, uh, and they were nice enough to put them in order for us from least to greatest amount of oil. So we know that Asia, this dark orange, is Asia Pacific with 42,000 million barrels would be have the least amount of oil. So that would be our answer for number one. And number two, interpret maps. How do the oil reserves in North America compare to those in the rest of the world? Well, again, we're going to go over to our key, find North America, 70.9, yellow. Uh, it falls just above Asia Pacific um, with having the least amount. So uh, all of these other areas have more. So North America would have a smaller amount compared to uh, the rest of the world. Number three, infer which part of the world probably exports the most oil to other areas. Uh, by logic, we would we look uh, at the numbers here. These ones in the middle uh, are very close. They seem like they have uh, maybe enough for themselves, but not. It's looking for what has an excess. So our only one with a significant amount of excess is the Middle East with 754, uh, so we would expect that they would be selling their oil to other parts of the world. All right, I'll give you just a second to get this jot jotted down if you would like. All right, then we'll move on. So dependence on foreign sources. Fossil fuels are not evenly distributed worldwide as we saw in uh, the figure in the last slide. Some nations have more deposits of fuel than others. The United States, for example, has extensive coal reserves. However, Middle Eastern nations such as Saudi Arabia and Iran have far more crude oil reserves than does the United States. Almost all modern technology and services depend in some way on fossil fuels. This means that a nation can suffer when its supplies become unavailable or very costly.
All right, so what are some disadvantages of foreign dependence? Well, nations that lack adequate fossil fuels are especially at risk. For instance, Germany, France, and South Korea, as well as Japan, consume far more energy than they produce. Therefore, nations such as these rely almost entirely on fuel imports from their economic well-being. In recent years, the United States has relied more and more on foreign energy. Today, the United States imports two-thirds of its crude oil. Such reliance means that seller nations can control energy prices. They can force buyer nations to pay more and more as supplies of fossil fuels decrease. So how do we reduce dependence on foreign oil? The United States government has enacted policies to reduce dependence on oil from, from some foreign nations. One policy calls for developing additional resources within the United States and some from those in Alaska. In addition, the United States has diversified its sources of petroleum and now receives much of its petroleum from nations other than those in the Middle East. For example, we now import a lot of oil from Canada, Mexico, Venezuela, and Nigeria. Another way to reduce dependence on foreign oil is to develop renewable energy sources, such as solar and wind power. We will learn more about renewable types of energy in the next chapter. Energy conservation. We want supplies of fossil fuels to last as long as possible, and one way to accomplish that is to reduce our use of them. In addition, if we are less dependent on fossil fuels, we can prevent some of the environmental damage they do. Energy conservation is the practice of reducing energy use to meet those goals. Conservation and transportation. Transportation accounts for two-thirds of the oil use in the United States. One way to conserve energy is to design and sell motor vehicles that use less gasoline. In addition, if taxes on gasoline were increased, gasoline would become more expensive and people would have to have a powerful reason to conserve gasoline. Drivers in many European nations pay much higher gasoline taxes than do drivers in the United States. Many critics of oil drilling in, in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge point out that our cars and trucks waste huge amounts of oil. They argue that a small amount of, of conservation would save the nation far more oil than it would obtain from the oil deposits in the Arctic refuge. Lastly, we have personal choices. Individual people can make choices that save energy. In addition to driving less, we can take other actions. For example, we can turn lights off in rooms that aren't being used. By turning down the thermostat, we can reduce the energy needed to heat homes or cool homes. We can buy appliances that conserve energy by looking at the uh, stickers when we buy them, the energy um, evaluations. And all of these actions can save money and reduce fossil fuel use. All right, guys, that's the end of Tuesday's lecture and the end of chapter 17.3. In your workbook for classwork, I'd like you to answer questions number 8 through 14. Again, I've uh, emailed the key home uh, for you. And then your homework tonight is uh, online at www.pearsonrealize.com, uh, which is lesson assessment 3, or I've posted it here if you're submitting your work through email. All right, guys. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow for, for chapter 17.4. Bye, guys.